evening to you all, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Osterfeld, for that very warm, warm welcome. It's a great a pleasure and honour for me to be in London, Ontario, to meet uh, Claude Penser and to join in thanking him for his interest in, in, the, in the law school, but particularly uh, in, uh, in this uh, uh, series. And it's also been a great pleasure to, to, to have sat at dinner with, 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 with the Dean. Um, it's been a wonderful day in London. I've enjoyed meeting a number of students this morning and this afternoon, and that's always, that's always a, great, a great, great pleasure. One thing I've learned is it's, it's a lot easier to get into Canada through London Airport than Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> this is the way I'm going to come in the future. Um, the, the topic I'm going to talk about, as has been mentioned and as advertised, is uh, accountability for war crimes. This is a very exciting and new development uh, in the international community. Uh, you know, not, not too many years ago, certainly in historical terms, before the Nuremberg trials in the middle of the 20th century, there was no such thing as international criminal justice. It didn't exist. Nobody would have understood really what, what, the, what the term meant. And it, uh, it was Nuremberg that was the first attempt, really, to make war criminals accountable, judicially accountable, and appropriately punished uh, for war crimes. And of course, it nearly didn't happen. Winston Churchill didn't think it was a good idea. He thought, you know, what's the point of trials? We know what the Nazi leaders did, put them up against the wall and shoot them. But it was the United States in particular, and of course, ironically, Marshal uh, 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 Stalin, who was most keen because he'd been he'd been holding show trials in in the Soviet Union for many years. So, for different reasons, the Americans and the Russians made common cause, and Nuremberg followed. It was assumed because of the success that Nuremberg was deemed to be, it was assumed that there would be an international criminal court set up soon after the end of Nuremberg. But of course that didn't happen because of the Cold War particularly. And the whole idea went to sleep for almost 50 years, sort of Rip Van Winkle like, and was only resuscitated in the, in the light of the uh, terrible crimes that were committed in the former Yugoslavia in 1993. And that only happened because it was in Europe. There was no international criminal court for Cambodia in the Pol Pot, in the aftermath of the Pol Pot genocide, and there was no international criminal tribunal uh, in the aftermath of the genocide committed by Saddam Hussein against uh, the Kurdish population of Iraq uh, uh, at that time. But because it was in Europe, I would suggest, uh, it became more politically necessary to do something about it. And the Security Council imaginatively set up the Yugoslavia Tribunal. And that was seen as partial and exceptional by Serbia. They said, why for us? They didn't do it for the others. Why do it for us? And uh, I, was, I was recounting earlier today that, that at my first meeting as Chief Prosecutor, at a meeting I had in Belgrade with the then Serb Minister of Justice, he said, why us? Why not these others? And I said to him, almost tongue-in-cheek and perhaps wishfully thinking, I said, Minister, if, this, if, if Serbia is the first and the last, then it's unfair. And I agree with you. But if Serbia is the first of others to come, then you have no reason to complain. Little did I know that there would be a Rwanda tribunal and within not too many years, a permanent international criminal court that we have today with 110 nations, well over half the members of the United Nations, having joined the international criminal court. And when I come to Canada, I feel particularly happy because Canada played the key role, probably the most important role of any nation, in, 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 in pushing for a permanent international criminal court. It led the group of so-called like-minded nations. I'm happy to say South Africa was one of them. But it was Canada that, 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 that really gave, gave the leadership, and it was appropriate 
that the first ever president of the International Criminal Court, of course, was Judge Philippe Kirsch uh, of Canada. And my, my connection with Philippe Kirsch is an interesting one, and I know uh, uh, Professor Osterfeld worked on his staff uh, at, at, uh, when he was the legal counsel at the, at the, foreign, uh, at, at the foreign Office in Ottawa. But, but when I was the Chief Prosecutor, he was my guardian angel in, uh, in Ottawa, and I remember him shepherding me to meeting after meeting with the then Foreign Minister and, 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 and members of government, and Canada played then already a very important, important role. So th this has developed very quickly. You now have an international criminal court investigating four situations. Perhaps, unfortunately, from a political point of view, they are all African situations. But that's not the fault of the court. Three of three of the four were referred by African governments. It was not the choice of the prosecutor, it was African governments themselves who chose uh, to, to refer themselves to the International Criminal Court. And the fourth, Darfur and Sudan, was referred by the Security Council itself. And the result of all this is that for the first time in the history of humankind, there is accountability for some war criminals. Not across the board, because some are exempt, because they come from powerful countries. Not easy to get people from Russia uh, 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 before a court for war crimes committed in Chechnya. Uh, to give an example, the big countries resist this. All countries resist having their sovereignty invaded, impugned. No, no government likes an international to, to have to to have to give judgment against their political uh, or, uh, or military leaders. So there's a resistance. A lot of countries think, well, this is a great idea for other countries, but leave us out. And that's certainly the United States' view. The United States played a key role in, in setting up the, the, the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunal. But when it comes to the International Criminal Court, they say, well, it's a jolly good idea, but don't, don't, don't include us. There, there is that, that duality uh, that, that one has, and that is, is, is really a symptom of power. And uh, the, the, the reason, I think, that explains that other large countries, Russia, China, India, have not joined in. But if the course continues in its present way of, of, of succeeding sufficiently to be uh, deemed to be successful, uh, I have every confidence that will change and it's going to become more and more difficult for countries not to join in. So this is a new world of withdrawing impunity from war criminals. Former war criminals have difficulty traveling around the world today. They didn't used to. Some of them, the late uh, 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 President Suharto of, 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 of Indonesia, not many years ago had to cancel medical treatment in a Frankfurt clinic because he got wind of an international warrant of arrest waiting for him at Frankfurt Airport. He had to have his, his medical treatment at home. The same was true of uh, the former dictator of Ethiopia, Hail Mariam Mengistu, who had to be to hasty retreat, retreat from a Johannesburg clinic because he feared arrest. So it's a very different, different world that we're living in. And uh, I have little doubt that in some cases, this has and will continue to act as some sort of deterrent. And it was my privilege to be involved as the effectively the first chief prosecutor of the Yugoslavia Tribunal and soon after the Rwanda Tribunal. It's also been my privilege to investigate uh, uh, violations of law um, uh, in, in my own country in South Africa to look at, at the Kosovo situation. And for that reason, I found it difficult uh, to, uh, to, to refuse an invitation uh, to, to get involved in the uh, recent inquiry into uh, alleged war crimes and human rights violations uh, committed uh, by the Israel Defense Force in Gaza and by the Hamas and other military groups uh, against southern Israel. It wasn't an easy decision, particularly coming from the Human Rights Council, which has a history of being uh, partial uh, against Israel and singling, uh, singling it out 
in many respects uh, for, for, special, for special treatment. And no fair-minded person approves of any form of bias or an absence of unevenness uh, and un uh, uneven handedness in that sort of situation. And when I was first approached by my fellow South African, who is the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Navi Pillay, uh, I refused because I didn't think that the, the, the resolution passed by the Human Rights Council was even handed. It talked about investigating war crimes only on one side. And it was only when the President of the Council, the former President, the then President of the Council earlier this year, the Nigerian Ambassador, said, said to me at a meeting, he asked me to come and attend with him, he said, how would you word an even-handed mandate in respect of these military operations? And I told him, and I told him in words that would include all, all allegations of war crimes on all sides relevant to the military operation. And he said, how would you, would you write it out for me? And I did. And he said, well, it's my power, my authority to appoint this inquiry. And if you're prepared to do it, that's the mandate you will have. Well, that was a very difficult invitation to receive <laughs> in those circumstances. And it was made very clear to the council and I met with the ambassadors of the four countries that proposed the original resolution and said, this is what we're going to investigate. And I was given to work with me three eminent, uh, two eminent lawyers and one uh, army expert on munitions, Desmond Travers from the Irish Army, a retired colonel from the Irish Army, uh, Professor Christine Schinken, a professor of international law from the London School of Economics, who I'm sure many in this room will know, and, and Hina Jelani, a very courageous, outstanding lawyer for Pakistan, from Pakistan, who has spent many years of her life in prison uh, because of her standing up against Pakistani uh, ill treatment of people and violations of human rights. And we we decided that we would do that we would accept this mandate. I must say, perhaps in hindsight, perhaps with naivete, I, I assume that an even-handed resolution from the Human Rights Council would appeal to the government of Israel. I thought that this would be the beginning, would be seen to be the beginning of a new direction by the Human Rights Council, and that the, that the Israeli government would seize this opportunity of having a United Nations in, uh, inquiry having a look at things that it thought important. And, 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 and we invited them to do that. I sent no less than three letters, two to the Geneva uh, Israeli ambassador and one to, to Prime Minister Netanyahu, asking for meetings with any appropriate Israeli officials, including the Prime Minister, to find out from them what issues they wanted us to investigate to allow us to come into Israel and speak to victims of rockets and mortar attacks, and to go through Israel to Gaza and to the West Bank to investigate what, what was happening there uh, in consequence of the military operation. But I must say to, to, to my great disappointment and, and great sadness, the attitude of the government of Israel was that they're not prepared to cooperate with any uh, mission set up by the Human Rights Council. And I'd committed myself and I had no option but to proceed without, and without that cooperation and in the face of a refusal to allow us even to come into the country as a mission to, to investigate war crimes committed by Hamas and military groups against the population of southern Israel. And we had to do it in other ways. Firstly, in order to visit Gaza, we had to get the cooperation of the Egyptian government and have the very inconvenient nine-hour trip twice in each direction from Cairo to Gaza. It was really inconvenient. We could have done the trip in probably an hour from Jerusalem. And we were not able to go to the West Bank at all because you can only get there through, through Israel. But with my South African experience, I decided that one way around this lack of cooperation was to hold public hearings. To hold public hearings in Geneva 
and invite witnesses to come and speak to us if we couldn't go to Israel or the West Bank to come and speak to us and the United Nations at, at our request flew witnesses from Israel and the West Bank to speak to us in Geneva. And because we were having public hearings there, we decided it was only appropriate to have public hearings in Gaza. And we had four days of public hearings, and if any of you are interested, you can view them uh, on the website of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. You can, you can Google it and you'll find it. And uh, the, you, you will find all four days uh, hearings there. Um, that was important. In addition, we decided to hold two days of interviews in Amman in Jordan, because that way, we could, again, it was convenient for people from Israel and from the West Bank to come and talk to us, not in public, but in private. Uh, in the public hearings in Geneva, we heard, we heard from the mayor of Ashkelon, who talked about the effect on southern Israel of rockets and mortars fired, thousands of them, over some years uh, from the Gaza Strip. We heard about the, the, the effect this had on school children, the terror to some million Israelis in that area. Uh, we, we heard from some victims who were injured uh, as a result of rockets and mortars. And we, we, we heard about the, the, the precautions taken by the Israel government, sirens warning never more than 40 or 45 Me, is that is that all right? Yes. Never more than 40 or 45 seconds warning uh, before these rockets landed, and it was really almost miraculous. I always hesitate to use the the, the, the analogy with miracle, but it was almost miraculous that it was that there were so few uh, Israelis killed and and injured as a result of those rockets and mortars because they were very imprecise instruments and they. They could have landed on hospitals or, uh, or schools, and, and, and some of them did, but not when they were, were, were occupied. And the, the fact that we weren't allowed in, we interviewed well over 40 people by telephone, uh, in addition to bringing witnesses, as I say, to Geneva. And one of the other witnesses we brought was the father of the Israeli soldier who was abducted, uh, Gilad Shalit. Uh, who, uh, who talked to us about the trauma that, his, that he and his family were suffering. We spent nine days in Gaza looking at the huge damage that was done to civilians as well as combatants and the huge damage to civilian structures, to schools, hospitals, thousands of homes, civilian homes, police stations, uh, and, uh, and it was really a very, for me, a very emotional and traumatic experience to, to see with my own eyes tremendous damage wherever one travelled uh, in the Gaza Strip, one of the most heavily populated areas in the world. One and a half million people in a very, very small strip of land uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. And uh, it, was, it was the people we spoke to and our, our report, unfortunately, is a very long one. It's nearly 600 pages long, and we deal with all of these issues and many others. And we talk about the, the, the incidents that we considered to be unacceptable from an international humanitarian point of view. Let me mention one that related to a, the, the, the shelling by the Israeli Defense Force of a mosque. It was a fairly newly constructed mosque, it was under three years old, and a service, the, the, the morning and evening services were combined during the war uh, because uh, it, it, was, it was decided by the leaders that the uh, people shouldn't be in the streets more than they had to. So they had the morning and evening services combined in the late afternoon. And this mosque was full, over 300 people. During the ceremony, a mortar shell comes through the front, the main front door of the mosque, kills 15 people worshipping and injures, and injures many more. Now there can be no justification at all 
for shelling a mosque when it's full of civilians praying. If, if, as has been alleged by the Israel government, mosques were used for uh, 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 Hamas fighters to, to hide, how many of those people, if there were any, how many of them, of the hundreds of people at that service would have fell, fallen into that category? The other reason given for attacking mosques was that they were kept to hide arms and ammunition. Well, even if that was correct, you can bomb it at night when there are no people in it. And, and, and let me say that in this case there were no secondary explosions and there was no evidence at all of arms being kept there. So it's that, that sort of incident, and I'm giving you one example from 36 that we detail in our report, in which you are able to, to, to access, and let me say there's a 32-page executive summary. I wish there was an executive summary of the executive summary. <laughs> we didn't have time to prepare one. Uh, but but, but, but the, the, the incidents of that kind. The other, the other concern our mission had was the destruction which had nothing to do with military targets at all. The destruction of the only flour producing factory left running in Gaza. For what, what possible military purpose? The destruction of agricultural fields by bulldozers, by tank bulldozers. The destruction of just about the, the, just about the whole of the egg production of Gaza the destruction of thousands, tens of thousands of chickens that were being kept for egg production. This was really, a, we found, a form of, of collective punishment of the people of Gaza, presumably because they elected a Hamas government. Well, of course, if the intention was to dissuade them from supporting Hamas, it had the very opposite effect. I think, if anything, it made Hamas more popular than it was before the military operation began. And, and we, we, we reported on these incidents, and let me immediately say that our, method, our methodology in respect of those incidents was to rely primarily on the people we spoke to, the evidence we were given, and what we saw with our own eyes, and to use other reports and, and, and hearsay information only for corroboration. Uh, and not uh, uh, as, as the kernel of our findings. We also got the, you know, I didn't know the United Nations has a satellite facility department called UNISAT. They rely on American satellites to, to get the imagery. But you'll find attached to our report a 35-page analysis that we requested with satellite photographs showing the destruction of agricultural fields and factories and, and nearly 200, over 200 factories destroyed. You will, see, you will see the before and after photographs indicating this. And we came to the conclusion that, and, 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 and it's not difficult really in my view to come to that conclusion, war, war crimes in, 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 in essence are crimes that are committed by military against civilians who are unnecessarily killed or injured. And when I say unnecessarily, I mean because there's no military advantage. Let me give you an example. If Canada was at war with the United States and there was a, a bomb-making, an ammunition factory in the middle of London, Ontario, surrounded by civilian houses, under the law of war, it's lawful it would be lawful for the United States to bomb that factory, even though it was in the civilian area. If it, if it could destroy it and, and kill a hundred civilians, or it could destroy it and kill two thousand civilians, the latter would be a war crime if that was the decision made, because it could have been destroyed with, with, with a far smaller number of civilian deaths and injuries. And the, 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 the test is what is reasonable, what is proportionate. And in our report, we also took care not to second guess decisions made in the heat of battle. You know, if, if, if soldiers are being shot at by the enemy and they take a decision to use certain arms or ammunition to protect themselves, to fight back, to take out the enemy 
uh, fighters. It's difficult, it's difficult to second guess them in hindsight and say, well, they could have taken less, less extreme measures. That's not the sort of issue we, we were looking at. We were looking at the use of white phosphorus, and, and we've, we've suggested in one of our recommendations that the United Nations should, should, should set afoot an inquiry into the use of white phosphorus and also a munition called flechettes. White phosphorus is used legally for illuminating a battlefield at night, and it's used legally for, for, for creating a smoke screen. But it's uh, considered generally as a war crime to use it in a civilian area for obvious reasons. White phosphorus is a substance that burns at a very high temperature for as long as it's exposed to any oxygen. So if white phosphorus lands on your, uh, on your arm, it will go on burning a hole through you until there's no oxygen available uh, to, to allow it to go on burning. It's a very dangerous substance to, to use where it lands uh, in a civilian area. As an illumination, it normally burns itself out in the atmosphere before it comes to, to land. But here it was used in a civilian area. It caused injuries, a number of injuries, and it caused some devastating, well, at least one devastating fire uh, where a food, food where a food facility of the United States was of, of, of the United Nations was, was completely destroyed. Flechettes are, are dots about that size, but they have a fin. And when they enter the human body, they they revolve and cause terrible injuries. Now there, there can be no reason to use flechettes in, in in combat in a civilian in a civilian area. Uh, but they were. So it, it, it was those, those sorts of incidents that, that, we, that, 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 that we investigated. We looked at the blockade that's been imposed by Israel on, on Gaza for some years, and, and which were made far more harsh since, since the Hamas government was elected uh, in, in, in 2006. But really at the expense of men, women and children who have got nothing to do with fighting, many of them not even supporters of Hamas. That's just by the way. We, we took into account the fact that the, the, the military operations launched by the Israel Defense Force began at 11.30 a.m. on a weekday morning. The first targets were five police stations. Now at 11.30 on a weekday morning, members of the public go to police stations. Let's just leave aside whether the police stations were, were, were lawful targets. We found they weren't. But why do it at the busiest time, when school children are coming out of school, when people are walking in the streets, when people are reporting robberies or whatever crimes you may have? Why in the first day bomb the, the, the prison and allow murderers to, to, uh, to escape? There was really, targets were chosen, which, which in the view of our mission, uh, were not justifiable on, on military grounds. So I, I invite any of you who are interested to have a look at the report, to read our methodology, to see what we went into, to, to understand. You, you know, I, it, one of the other factors that, that caused me to be concerned was fishing. Fishing's, f fish is an important source of food for the people of God. Under the Oslo agreements, which Israel agreed to, the fishermen of Gaza were entitled to fish up to a 20-mile limit. Unilaterally, the Israelis reduced that to three miles. And if Gaza fishermen go over the three-mile limit, they shot at, and many of them have been, have been injured and some killed uh, because they've gone over the three-mile the three limit. There, 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 there's this sort of sort of issue which we've, which we've had a look at. We also looked at the serious human rights violations committed by Hamas against fellow Palestinians in Gaza. The, the Hamas authorities have been responsible for the assassination and torture and detention of Fatah supporters. Intra-Palestinian violence. And if we go to the West Bank and we investigate it and we report on it fully, you'll find it in our report, on the West Bank, similarly, the Palestinian Authority 
assassinated and detained and tortured people because they were Hamas supporters. They interfered with freedom of expression and freedom of demonstrations against, against a Hamas supporters who were demonstrating in favour of fellow Hamas supporters in Gaza. So it, it's an area, it's, it, it's an area, unfortunately, and this is what makes peace talks difficult, it's an area where there are very, very few goodies and too many baddies. And the, the, the report details all of these problems. It's certainly my hope that the truth will assist. I, I, I take the greatest objection to being labelled as anti-Israel or anti-Palestinian or anti-anybody else. As far as I'm concerned, what our mission did was in the interest of all people of the Middle East. And it's certainly our hope that our recommendations would assist. We, we have recommended, our main recommendation, and let me end on that and I'll be happy to answer questions. Our main recommendation is that the Security Council of the United Nations, as it can, should demand of Israel and indirectly insist that the de facto government of Gaza, led by Hamas, should hold its own open and and, and, and efficient and fair investigations of these alleged war crimes. They should do it themselves. And our recommendation is if they don't do that, and they're able to do it, I have no doubt. If they don't do, do that, then the Security Council should consider uh, referring this matter to the International Criminal Court, uh, which, which also it has the power to do, as it did in the case of the Sudan. We've made many other recommendations, but those are the most important. Whether they'll have traction, whether they're politically naive, whether they're going to have any effect, I don't know. But one thing I do know is that Hamas is on notice that the firing of rockets and mortars is a serious war crime. We have said that, 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 that a court could possibly hold them to be crimes against humanity. The Israeli Defence Force should be on notice that, that, that the conduct of military operations in the way they were conducted uh, seven and eight months ago uh, constitutes, constitutes serious war crimes, and we said that too may possibly amount uh, to, to, to crimes against humanity. So, so, so there it is. We've done our job. We uh, will be presenting the report to the Human Rights Council. It will, I hope, accept the report and its recommendations, and how, how much further it goes will depend on the political will, I would suggest mainly of the Western nations and preeminently of the United States. Thank you very much.